in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Dustin Melbarnes, Nathan Lutz, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable, the podcast where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Chad Robinson, and joining me today from Spokane, Washington, my good friend, Brian Fry. Brian, what's the news? Oh, uh, well, cold. We went back to a a nice balmy four degrees today, which made walking the dog special. And uh, my daughter wants nothing to do, nothing else to do but to go out and play in it. And I'm like, you will freeze to death. Right. Right. So that's uh, that's just kind of where we're at right now. I get the same thing. Can I go ride my bike? There's six inches of snow. No, you may not. (laughs) Got to get her that fat tire, man. Yeah, I, I am excited today, though. Do you know why I'm excited, Brian? I think we probably have a pretty special guest. We do. We have a return guest, which is the best kind of guest. Featured previously on Working Girl, joining us, Kathy Hoskinson. How are you doing, Kathy? I'm doing great, and I'm, as I was before, happy to be here in February. Nice, uh, good weather here in Phoenix, by the way, to talk about an 80s movie with my millennial buddies. Yeah. Yeah, humble brag there of good weather right now. (laughs) Spokane to Phoenix and Pittsburgh to Phoenix. Yeah, not not doing so well. But yes, we are doing another 80s movie, coincidentally, with Joan Cusack in February. So I am fine with this being a tradition. But but just just to really key in this point, you are happier to be on this one than you were on the last one, right? (laughs) Right, because Brian, you were not on the first one and I was crushed. I was crushed. Yeah. So I just I just wanted to make sure that for the record, it's on tape. Happier to be here this time. Yes, Brian's well, ego I, very fragile. I was told I was told this would be a Brian episode, and I jumped right on it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Thank so you. so we've got our warm up questions. We'll start with you, Kathy, since you're our guest. What's the last movie you saw? It doesn't have to be in the theaters, but just the last movie in general. Well, I love what's happened with movies. And I mean, it's not good for the people making them because they don't make as much money. But I saw Nightmare Alley, which is still in the theaters, but it came out on HBO Max almost at the same time, a little bit delayed. That's the uh, the new Guillermo del Toro movie mm-hmm. with. Uh, yeah. And it's and it's funny. I didn't realize it was a remake uh, of a movie from the 40s. Oh, yeah, yeah. but it is. Realize. And it and it's. Uh, it's a great movie. It's nominated for Best Picture this year. And just, and I want to give a shout out. There's a, I saw this about two months ago. Um, another one of the uh, Oscar nominees, uh, Coda, C O D A. Great movie. It's a coming of age movie, so I might be a little old for it, but it really is not a young, a YA type movie. It's, it's a great movie for folks of all ages who, who love, you know, just, triumph of the spirit <laughs> type tales and it's got my buddy from the 80s marley matlin matlin remember her from uh, children of a lesser god that's when i was introduced to her as as an actress um she's in it and a- absolutely wonderful as always um so i recommend coda as well i saw that about two months ago it's on apple tv awesome yeah that nightmare alley has definitely been on my list i haven't gotten to it yet but i'm excited to get to it brian other than Dune for the 87th time, <laughs> what was the last movie? You brought movie? it up, not me. Yeah, yeah. I'm just beating <laughs> you to it. What was the last movie not named Dune that you've seen? Uh, I'm actually going to have to go kind of heavy on this one. I uh, finally got around to seeing The Last Duel. Okay, yes. I enjoyed oh. it. Oh, no, I did too. Uh, I had no idea uh, about the film concept of three different points of views. I, I wasn't prepared for that in a, in a Ridley Scott film. 
until it, when it happened, I actually thought something had gone wrong with my, <laughs> my download. So that was kind of funny. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously some heavy topics there and uh, some 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 rough imagery, but uh, overall a really, really interesting film. And you get to see Ben Affleck playing Ben Affleck if Ben Affleck lived back then. Right. Yeah, the, the haircut was a questionable design decision, but... Uh, I. Yeah. I seriously still think that someone needed to go back in time and tell Matt Damon that nothing he had going on was acceptable (laughs) in in, in any, like it doesn't matter court, not court, wherever you're holding anything, that mullet is unacceptable. Yeah. The goatee too. Yeah. Yep. I'm with you there. So I, I too kind of hit up Oscar season. I saw the power of the dog getting a lot of nominations and after seeing it i don't i don't get it so i'm gonna be that guy i i watched it i was like eh, benedict cumberbatch this will be cool yeah it, it didn't it didn't work it didn't go down well for me but i think it's got something like 12 oscar nominations so i still recommend giving it a shot it's free on netflix we're gonna get into our next question Kathy, what's a broadcast story that you most remember? Because we're going to be talking a lot about broadcasts. Well, I mean, you know, I'm going to be stuck if I can't say something like, you know, 9-11. I wish I could come up with memorable broadcasts that that weren't significant. I mean, obviously, in recent uh, memory, I was... You know, I worked from home and I, you know, last year on the 6th of January, you know, I had the TV on, I was working, but I had the TV on because I thought, oh, something's going to go down. Let's, right. let's check this out. <laughs> um, and that was quite a, whew, that was a, wow, that was, I did not see that level of activity coming or the lack of uh, preparedness for it. Um, so that, that was a memorable broadcast in terms of news anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely tragic, unfortunate, everything you could you could say about it. Uh, Brian, how about you for broadcast stories? I do not visually consume news sources. This this probably comes uh, back at some point uh, to my my days in J school. But uh, yeah, I typically read the news. Uh, I have a hard time. I have a hard time with broadcast, <laughs> yeah. but anyway, uh, I, I mean, I, I think it's gotta be nine 11 just in terms of the fact that was the hallmark of, uh, you know, that was our Cuban missile crisis. That was our, you know, it was a thing that we were, were hanging on to. We got pulled out of class for it, that sort of thing. Yeah. So I, I mean, I feel like that's gotta be it because that is the first thing that comes to mind. But I mean, there's been, you know, various things. I mean, heck, I was like first person at the phone out of their pocket when, you know, Putin hit Ukraine yesterday. So anyway, I mean, it, it, you can take your pick, but in terms of broadcast, I would say that that is the number one most televised piece that I was fairly glued to. See, we went to the same high school, but my teacher for 9-11 said, math goes on. Right. No. Actually, actually, mine did too. I, I was in art class and yeah. she said, I don't care what's happening on the TV. You can watch it after you're done here. Yeah. So uh, that, that doesn't surprise me knowing your art teacher. Yes. Yeah. Right. 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 She's awful. So, <laughs> so for me, it, this is going to be one of my young, youngest memories in kindergarten. I can remember the Gulf War being broadcast, which is a weird thing to do for kindergartners, but our teacher, I don't know if she was just kind of absentee or what. One of the few things I remember from kindergarten was the Gulf War broadcast. And so that was kind of my introduction to we can kill each other as an option. And that was probably way too early of an age to be exposed to that. But that's what our teacher chose to do. I watch coverage. So that's that's what stuck with me. Well, yeah. And now it's bringing it back to the 80s, just and I'm dating myself here. Um, I. I remember the shuttle, uh, sorry, the Challenger explosion. I said oh. shuttle for some reason. Oh, um, live. Yeah. I saw it live because we were all watching the launch yeah. um, because there was, a, I mean, we had a civilian on board. Yeah, a teacher. Um, a teacher. 
and so we were all I, well if you were available if you weren't at work or school or wherever um but we had it on and um yeah that was uh that was something because that was just i mean there was just this collective sort of double take like w- wait a minute what just happened right. um and then you kind of it just kind of sets in like oh no that's what happened so yeah and that was 86 right oh my yes i believe it was yeah, I'll definitely date myself here. So it, I was two when that happened, but I remember watching videos of that later on in school in the 90s. And it's it's crazy how I have employees right now who look at 9-11 and think, oh, that was history. Right. And yeah, like that's that's it's a crazy thing when you realize that you've lived through enough things that, you know, younger generations now view it as not something, you know, devastating, but as something that happened before them. And, and it, that's, it's, it's wild. Yeah, absolutely. So Brian, what movie are we going to be covering today? Speaking of news stories. Well, we are going to be doing the movie Broadcast News from 1987. It grossed around $51 million. It's uh, placed in the box office that year. It was 18. It, it was placed, or the movie that placed ahead of it was Outrageous Fortune. Behind it was The Living Daylight, so nod to our uh, previous 007 features. Right. And the number one movie of that year was Eddie Murphy's Beverly Hills Cop 2, which is... Also awesome. IMDb gives this a 7.2. I think that's probably good. That's that's probably accurate. And uh, uh, Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 98% with an audience score of 79. So obviously the critics liked it better than the audience. Yeah, still great scores, though. I mean... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, none of this is, is uh, damning in any way. But it, it's interesting to me. Uh, I see one way or the other happening so often where, you know, critics are giving this like rave reviews. And I wonder sometimes if they're scared to give <laughs> something that's getting attention, a bad review. I, I do. I, I wonder if they have the same analytics that go through my head. Like I watch something and I'm like, Oh man, I hate this movie. This is going to clean up. <laughs> well, I think maybe today, yeah, maybe today they, they don't want to be contrarian, but certainly back in the day, I mean, I can I just, and you know I bring the stats, right? Yeah. I'm an analyst, so Chad understands. Yes. Um, but, you know, it it was, it came, in fact, I had, I remembered seeing the trailer and I, you know, I'm a big, big James Brooks fan anyway. Um, and I wanted to see it in the theater, but it just, it was in limited release. And then even after it went wide release, just to give a comparison, Beverly Hills Cop made about 150. I'm just talking about domestic box office. They made about 150 million over maybe 2,400 theaters in wide release. Broadcast News made 51 million in about 800 theaters in wide release, and it was not in theaters for nearly as long. And so it it was it was it's was extremely highly regarded and popular with a certain demographic. I guess that's the point, right? And it's the same. It seems to be the same demographic that the that you know would include a lot of the critics. It was you know it's a, it's cerebral. There's there's satire. There's you know um, a lot of jokes that people there you know it's not uh, not laugh out loud. Well, I mean it is laugh out loud funny, but it's not uh, for some people. So I think that it did well. It did extremely well with that demographic. Yeah. So this you mentioned funny. This lines up on AFI's hundred years hundred best comedies at number sixty four. And this this is something that I continually push back. There are funny moments in this movie, but I would never put it in best comedies. It's only because they don't know where to put this. This this is another one of those instances where a movie outlies where popular genre identification lives. And because of that, it just lives someplace where people think it shouldn't. Well, it's a it's a comedy drama, though. I mean, it definitely has elements. But I mean, it, I don't know if you remember the part where, you know, um, they're on 
they're on assignment in the in Nicaragua, I think, with the Sandinistas and the Contras, and mm-hmm. you know they're 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 literally capturing live warfare. And um, Albert Brooks' character said, "What did he say? Something to to the effect of." After it was all said and done, and they were like, "Okay, did you, you know, did you get the shot? Did we get it? Was there enough light?" He he literally said something like, um, "I can't believe I risked my life for people who who test my face with focus groups." <laughs> um, so stuff like that. That's to me. That's laugh out loud. That's hysterically funny. That that is a huge joke, and there that kind of humor is all over the place in there. So I think it just depends on where your where your humor tastes lie. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something for everybody. This one cleans up on a, awards. It's nominated for seven Academy Awards. It's nominated for five Golden Globes. And it is included in the thousand and one movies you must see before you die. So, well, that alone right there precludes it from being in the uh, comedy category. The thousand well, and one yeah. movies. Well, yeah. And, you know, it's funny, we were talking a moment about, you know, a moment ago about Ridley Scott and why that, you know, the type of movie that he would would make would not make it, you know, win Best Picture, perhaps. I, don't, I mean, it should. I would think we all agree, right? Yes. Alien Alien was nominated, though, I have Gladiator to say. Gladiator won, yep. yeah. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yes, 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 yes. You can tell this is not my demographic, so I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little bit... <laughs> Ridley is a huge like I'm a huge Ridley fan, but he's a whiner. So (laughs) y'all like you you won't offend me at all by saying anything about him because he deserves most of it. Yeah, but this year like 1987 was just insane for movies, and The Last Emperor won, and not because it was a particularly compelling story, but because just it was so beautifully shot. It was an epic. So the epic of that year won, but we're talking about the same year where we had Wall Street, right? Mm -hmm. We had... um, Oh gosh, Moonstruck! Everybody loved Moonstruck. Broadcast News, I think. Didn't we have um, Vietnam movie with Robin Williams? Holy crap! <laughs> uh, good morning, Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, I think they were all the same year, and so it, it had a lot of competition, a lot of really quality movies, and of course, like I said, Last Emperor won, which you know, okay, the Academy went in a different direction, I think, on that one. Yeah, yeah, and so. So going into this movie, Kathy, this was one of your short list movies. And sometimes our guests will throw us curveballs and they have not seen this movie before. But I, I'm getting the sense, have you seen broadcast news before? And if you have, what what was it like when you first saw it? And what's it like returning to it now? Well, so I was, you know, back in the 80s when the trailer came out, I wanted to see it in the movie in, in theaters, but I missed it. And of course, I had to, you know, wait for it to come out on okay don't don't panic i'm going to say a term you might not be familiar with vhs oh yes <laughs> i'm joking i know you guys know what it is but i had 240 of those bastards and i still <laughs> hold on to three or four of them just out of posterity yeah. yeah there's a box in my house that's got probably about 50 of them but um so i had to i did have to wait to rent it so but i i wanted to see it because this is this was a movie that was right up my alley and holly hunter was this was the this was sort of the mainstream Holly Hunter, but if you're a Coen Brothers fan, right? Mm-hmm. She was in Raising Arizona earlier that year, so folks were starting to to get to know who who she was, and um, so I was very interested in seeing it, and uh, and it didn't disappoint at all. In fact, I was it was better than I thought it would be. By the way, just as on a, as an aside, James Brooks, Terms of Endearment was, and I kid you not, I'm talking about I. I saw like Bambi and didn't cry. <laughs> Terms of Endearment is the first movie that made me cr- like actual cry. Justifiable. Um, yes. Yeah. For, and I, I'll never forget it for that reason. Cause I'm sitting there and I'm like, why am I crying? This is insane. This is nuts. But so I, I was not disappointed. It is one of my all time, you know, faves and it has stood the test of time. I think uh, certainly with its uh, subject matter, um, and the way the industry and, and the folks who work in it, uh, I'm talking about journalism, are portrayed, the dynamics of network news, the, the, the characters, the layers, they stand the test of time. I think it's, I think that, that the character development in that movie is, was fantastic. I mean, I, I don't understand why he didn't win for screenplay, but what do I know, you know? 
<laughs> I, yeah, it, I love this movie. I really do. I just, I watched it yesterday again in preparation for this, for this yeah. podcast. Yeah. This movie seems prescient in some of its criticisms. Oh, hundred percent. Oh, a thousand yeah. percent. <laughs> Chad, hard question on the cusp. What was the first movie you ever cried in or have you? I, yeah, I've, I've cried a ton. I, I don't remember the first one, but I, I can remember the one that's banned on my list. Actually, there are several. The Fox and the Hound being the absolute earliest one. I cannot watch that. It's just the, we'll always be friends. It's like, no, you won't. You will not be friends. You will just attempt to not murder each other. That, that yeah. movie, uh, Toy Story 3 is also on the ban list. I cannot do the furnace with the toys. I, that's, that's, I, I have, I have a blacklist of movies. I outwardly refuse to see because I've heard tale of them being like, you know, hit you in the feels, uh, up is on that list. Oh. The notebook is on that list. Like I, I, I have outwardly refused to it. Jess actually gave me an ultimatum for Valentine's day. She said, I will be on your podcast, but you have to watch the notebook. And I was like, Okay, sorry. Oh no. Yeah. Like that's... just 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 I look, I watch movies for entertainment. I do not watch movies to, you know, pra- practice pilates of emotional well-being. Like that's not what I do. Like just watches this is us and I'm like, "Okay, I'm going to be in the kitchen doing anything else than this." <laughs> So it, it's just one of those things, but the one that uh, that completely ambushed me and just looked at me like it would, for for you guys listening, just as my wife, we went to see Big Fish mm. in theaters. Yep, and the end of that movie made me cry so bad, and she's looking at me like I'm an alien. She's like, "This, <laughs> this is what gets you," and I was just like, "Oh my god, it was all true." So. <laughs> So anyway, I was just curious, like, you know, it you get you get nailed with some things uh, out of left field sometimes. So I was kind of curious what what gets you guys. The notebook gets you at the end. The problem with up is it gets you in like the first 15 minutes. So you're crying right off the bat. And it's just I like, just I have no interest in that. Like, I have no interest in that, like, level of. Like, <laughs> I don't want to feel the, feel the world. The, no, the world sucks right now. I don't need extra. I don't right. need extra. So it's All right. great. All right. But had you seen broadcast news? Was this Is this a story that makes you cry? No, I was actually really excited about this because I'm a huge newsroom fan. Yes, um, that's I don't, good. I don't, so, any, yeah, I was, I was really amped up to see this because I'm also a big William Hurt fan. And I was like, all right, how did I miss this? How did how – did, four and a half years of journalism school not at least <laughs> ring someone ring a bell and say hey have you seen broadcast news i feel like this is a a huge ball drop for me so as soon as this came up in casual conversation i volunteered as tribute yeah that is surprising actually that in all of your years of journalism school they didn't somebody didn't just say you know watch broadcast news even if it's not in class i'm like brian i i I had not only not seen this movie, I had not heard of it. I'm a Jeff Daniels newsroom. That was a that was a very enjoyable program. I I enjoyed that series quite a bit. So that was kind of the expectation I brought into broadcast news. And you know, Russell was kind of tainting the water because he texts me and says, Hey, just to warn you this is not a comedy. It's building correctly. It's more like sideways. And if you l- listen to the podcast in the past, that's sideways wrong. is wrong. That's you need to not listen to Russell anymore. When no. he compares things. That's Russell's comparison was way off, but sideways is like my punching bag of movies that are built as comedies that I hate because they're not funny. Um, this, it had funny moments, but I was pre-warned of, eh, it's not really a comedy. It's more like a dramedy thing. So yes. he got that just, you know, don't associate it with sideways. I, I think it's it's more deserving than than that movie. But if you like sideways, good for you. I probably need to revisit it. I saw it too young and I'm just like, I don't get this culture. So this is a movie I'm, I'm glad I saw in my 30s. I think had I gotten to it earlier, I wouldn't have been mature enough 
to handle some of the subjects and to appreciate it. So I really appreciated it this time, and I I had a good time with the movie. It's got romance, comedy, drama, and criticism of the real world. So yeah, all of this satire works for me. So I'm excited to talk about it. We're going to take a quick break for ads, and then I'm going to spoil the movie. So if you have not seen 1987's broadcast news, go check it out. Put us on pause, watch it, and then we'll be back. What happens when two modern film fans go back and rewatch all the old classic films from yesteryear to see if they hold up? You get the Classic Film Jerks podcast. Find the Classic Film Jerks podcast on all the major platforms. Welcome to the Flashback Flicks Retro Movie Podcast. I'm Ricky. I'm Grayson. And every week we review a movie from the past and reflect on things we miss, things we loved, and things we want to see again. Yeah, because we believe any movie worth watching is worth watching again. So if you like films, friendship, and a lot of callbacks, I mean, just so many callbacks, then subscribe on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever RSS feeds go for like-minded, movie-loving individuals like you and we're back so i just want to warn you one last time spoilers lie ahead for 1987's broadcast news jane craig is a news producer who's passionate about reporting and hates broadcast fluff pieces her best friend aaron altman is a talented writer and reporter but it's socially awkward i feel that their washington dc station hires tom grunick a local sports anchorman who is tall, handsome, but isn't very bright. When news about a Libyan plane bombing a U.S. base in Italy breaks, the network chief puts Tom as anchor and Jane as an executive producer. Aaron is upset by the decision as he extensively covered related topics but winds up feeding information to Jane to help the broadcast. The segment is a huge success but also starts a mutual attraction between Jane and Tom. Tom creates a news piece on date rape, including an interview with a rape victim where he breaks into tears during the interview. Aaron is unimpressed, but Jane is moved. Aaron receives an opportunity to anchor the weekend news, which is his dream job, but he bombs miserably and declares his love for Jane in his miserable state. Jane rejects him, but not before he warns her about Tom. The station goes through a massive layoff. Aaron winds up quitting rather than being a low paid employee jane winds up getting a new job within the company and tom is given an anchor position in london before tom leaves he asks jane to take a romantic getaway with him jane agrees but she revisits tom's raw interview tape with the date rape victim only to find out that he had reshot a portion to appear more sensitive aaron was right jane then refuses to leave with tom and ends their relationship We skip forward to seven years later, Tom is a national anchor who refers Jane to become his managing editor in New York. She declines a dinner invitation with Tom and his new fiancé, but does catch up with Aaron, who now has a wife and child of his own. So, short plot summary, but we really, this is a dense movie. There's there's a lot of... There's a lot to unpack it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, there's and there's such great depths of character. I mean, I just there is not one, you know, one dimensional character in this entire movie. And the way you understand the way James Brooks allows you to understand the characters is is just brilliantly done. I mean, even just something as subtle as I mean, obviously, by the time we get to this point in the movie, we know Aaron. I mean, for all his gifts, why is he so insecure? I, I wondered about that. I mean, you know, yes, he's not as he's not as handsome as William Hurt, right? But he, you know, he's he's not a troll either, and it just it just didn't make sense. But something has has made this man very anxious and insecure and feeling unworthy when he is obviously brilliant and quite gifted. But the part where the the Washington office senior editor, I, I forget his title. Um, brings his daughter in to meet Tom because she's star- she's starstruck, yeah. right? Remember how he f- just was like, "Oh, she needs to remember me." I-, I went on a trip with them, and he's like, you know, and this is a, a, like a fifteen or sixteen year old girl. Who who cares? I mean, right. you know, and he's just—it's like he's almost begging for her to 
want to remember meeting him and and give him attention the way she's giving attention to to Tom, who's like a star to her. It, it was that that to me just the the, the depth of what that meant for, for Aaron's character and, and how insecure he was. Um, I, I thought a lot about Aaron cause I'm a big Albert Brooks fan. <laughs> so yeah. And it just it, amazing. I could go on with many, many scenes that, that are so that do do so much with so, so little dialogue. You're right. Even when we're first introduced, so this movie starts off in 1963 and it's kind of giving us these comedic introductions to all the characters so we have Tom's character, and he's like, what can you do when you're just good looking? And then it flashes <laughs> in, future network anchorman. But for Aaron, he's graduating high school at 15, and he's taking shots at his classmates of basically, hey, you guys were jerks to me. And even as he's getting beaten up, he's telling the bullies, you're only going to make $19,000. So yeah. he seems to have in no filter. He's got an inability to shut his mouth when he it would behoove him to do so. Yeah, and it's anger too, isn't it? It's yeah, anger. Absolutely. Underlying. I absolutely love his character. Like his his character is exact. Like it, at no point in time do I regret his decisions, outside of the fact that I think there it, it comes with some self awareness that right. when you are good behind a typewriter does not equate to behind a camera right. when you are good in the field it does not equate to good in the newsroom and there's no shame in that yeah uh the, the only shame in that is that they do not get paid the same right that is right. that that was my biggest issue with this was dude you do you like you've got songwriters all over the country writing hits for people who do nothing but put their face on albums Right. There's no shame in that. You are you are driving this. You are that piece. Right. And why did he need so? Yeah, because obviously he I think he hit a little bit of a rock bottom because I think he I think he really, you know, he and Jane for as close as they were, they were not on the same page about, nope. you know, she did not reciprocate <laughs> at all when he was mooning over her. Yeah. And so I, he needed to, you know, get a little bit of a heartbreak in there for him to realize the, to ask himself the question that I've been asking all along, you're brilliant. You're, you know, you're, you're a nice looking guy. I mean, why aren't you confident and happy and having a date that you want with a, with a woman that you like and, and doing your best work. And he kind of had that epiphany at the end after hitting a bit of a rock bottom. And, and he said, you know, I, why can't I just be happy doing what, what, it, what it is I do extremely well? Why am I so worried about, pleasing or or getting people to respect me that you know that don't respect me for for what i've already delivered um and i thought that was a great evolution for his character yeah it was interesting i was talking to russell and i said this is a movie typically when you present characters like this we have three main characters that we cover and it's aaron it's tom and it's jane when you present characters as unlikable i guess because aaron his qualities he is petty he is mm -hmm. jealous and he's kind of a bad friend in the end his advice works out but he's he's sabotaging jane a little bit in in her potential happiness before he really asked the question hey how many camera crews were were with you tom how many how many were in the shot but even prior to that, he's actively trying to sabotage other people's happiness because he's just, he's petty and jealous. So usually I have this problem in Tarantino movies or to a much lesser artistic extent, Rob Zombie movies where none of the, none of the characters are like, who am I rooting for? So yeah. He's, none of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think just showing these, these flawed people like he's still his advice in the end when he's telling jane oh yeah and tom's the devil it it winds up being right but yeah he's he recognizes it's not good for you but he just he's got that social awkwardness where he's not able to put it all together i guess and and hopefully out in portland you know he he got it together he clearly met met a woman and uh 
he has a kid now and he seems good with his kid. So I, I hope Portland mellowed him. I think he got one of the happier endings. Yeah. Well, Portland is, he, you know, Portland mellowed him, but also I think that that anger, because you're right, he, you know, these are complicated people. It's not as much as, you know, because even Tom, I mean, we'll talk about Tom. I don't think he was even the villain, really. And I love that devil quote, by the way. But um, and that devil quote, actually, I still use that to this day. And I'll I'll tell you why. But in a minute. But uh, yeah, I think that he he did bad things or he said he said mean things. Right. Um, Because he had an underlying he had an insecurity that made him, like you said, petty and angry. I have no idea. It must have had, probably happened in his upbringing, maybe because he went to school and was the smartest kid. And this was before nerds. It was cool to be a nerd, right? And so all the jocks beat him up. Maybe that was the origin of that. But I, right. <laughs> yeah. yes. And, you know, so maybe maybe that's he, he was able to uh, to work through that. I mean, it clearly it seems like he did. And thank goodness, because it was really bringing him down. And, and yeah, he was a jerk in, in a few, several scenes in this movie. But he has that great scene where he's singing and reading simultaneously. <laughs> and my brain just cannot I can function. Sing and read at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was that was great. And he he'd been drinking, obviously, too. I don't I couldn't tell what Brian, you're our cocktail person, but I don't know what he was drinking. But it seemed horrendous when he's dipping his finger in something and swirling it around. And then, oh, you know what that was? That was it was it was vodka and ice. And then that was concentrated orange juice. He couldn't be bothered to make the orange juice. So he pulled out the can of concentrate and was, yeah, scooping it into the. Oh, that is horrendous. The one, that, the one thing that caught me in that scene, I was like, who keeps ice in, like, a ashtray next to their <laughs> drink? It's like, did, like, did he really not have a bowl of any sort? I mean, because at first I was like, did he just put pistachios in his cocktail glass? I was like, is he that drunk? And then I realized it was just a really, really, like, short ashtray with ice in it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, man. That's okay. You're in that spot. Yeah, and and the and the open open thing of concentrate. That was it was like yeah we we're just gonna go straight to the drinking. We're not even gonna <laughs> we're not even gonna add water. We're just pff, there. And Kathy, you mentioned Tom, and I Tom seems like the guy for ninety nine percent of this movie you're rooting for. He just takes his lumps and smiles and perseveres and and his scene with Aaron where I think Aaron is realizing oh Tom really has something to add because Tom's coaching him and going through all of these motions and inflections it's like oh this person that I've looked down upon actually is good at his job he may not be the smartest person in the room but he knows what he's doing and so I'm cheering with him until he kind of has that character twist and he mentions that the viewers are suckers. And it's like, oh, oh, you've he was so good he fooled me. So. Well, I think here's the thing, right? So he does not have – okay, Jane and, and Aaron are purists. They are – I mean, they are the ones that you want, you know, investigating and presenting – the news yes because they this is this they take the, their responsibility very seriously and he's tom's salesman but the good what, what we like about tom or me i'm look i'm talking for everybody but what i really liked about tom and what i think a lot of the audience would also appreciate about him is that he he knows his limitations and he has a very i think good understanding of what a lot of people in the business took a little bit longer to figure out, which is people, for whatever reason, right, people want their news delivered a certain way and they want certain news delivered to them at certain times. And you can be the best journalist in the world, but, you know, you, you can, you're you not going to be the person who's going to be successful, you know, on the 7 o'clock nightly, nightly news for some reason. And he understands Okay, I'm contributing because for whatever reason, maybe it's my face, probably it's my face. Mm-hmm. People people if if I'm the one doing the talking, 
people will listen. And he didn't want to be the one influencing what was said because he wanted to leave that to, to more uh, qualified people. And I think that's to his credit because he said, I know what my limitations are, but I also know how I can contribute. And he, he did that um, consistently, even though they, yeah, they took some serious shots at him, which I thought were inappropriate. And, you know, Jane is, you know, Jane's arrogant. I mean, anybody, I mean, I would not have gotten away with telling my father, you know, in, in instructing my father on, on the, on the meaning of the word obsession, oh, if he no. had called me obsessed, like that would not have, that would not fly in my house. Nope. So, you know, she's, you know, she's that. And I loved, by the way, I'm glad you brought that up. I loved those opening scenes with each character as the, the teenager version of themselves it was fantastic yeah. um because it's it gave us a lot of insight right before their adult versions even stepped on the screen but yeah i mean she's you know she took a lot of nasty shots at him and it's not his fault that the people who run the business are recognizing that his role is important too right yeah tom he reminded me and they actually referenced the sweating of richard nixon for aaron yeah but it it reminded me, and it may be intentional, it may not be, but one of the things we studied in my media and communications was the Nixon-Kennedy debate, because yeah. this was the first broadcast debate. And it was interesting because they took different polls, and the polls for the people that listened on the radio said, Nixon won, hand it, hands down. But the people that watched the debate on TV saw a very handsome John Kennedy and they saw a very sweaty, shifty Richard Nixon. And everyone that watched on TV said, Kennedy won that very easily. And so we see this shift away into, oh, what you look like matters. What you yep. sound like matters. How you stand, how you carry yourself, right or wrong, matters. And I I thought it was an interesting illusion that they brought up Nixon for Aaron uh, and his sweating. And, you know, he may have been more qualified with intelligence or his writing or whatever else, but he couldn't put that handsome face and that inflection and and do it all with his intelligence. He couldn't do the same things that Tom was doing. Yeah, that joke was was in, intentional. I have no doubt that James Brooks meant for all of that association to be made when he inserted that joke. I mean, that's just the brilliance of his uh, of his writing in this particular screenplay. Um, because yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, I, I I would imagine Brian, you probably this probably came up in 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 journalism school. Just how how the televised debates between Kennedy and Nixon just changed everything, changed the whole landscape of politics for for folks in these really high-level national positions. Uh, well, 100%. Anytime you can put a video camera on the person who's telling you what you're supposed to be you know, understanding is going to be a, a huge piece. And one of the things that this, this movie really like struck a chord with me with was there were people trying to say something back in the 80s about how we were watching how we were consuming media and and this was really important i mean this was this was something that that i didn't get to to even have a, a boxing glove on until the mid 2000s and you know we're talking 20 years later at this point so one of the things i really really loved about this movie was watching holly hunter and watching Albert Brooks, like, stick to their guns. And I loved that about this movie. Yeah, and, and we've we've talked about the other two, but let's get into Jane, who is, she's probably the most complex character in this entire movie, because it just seems like she's being pulled into just different passions. She is passionate about her work. But then we see her meet Tom and she's passionate about him. And there's the, this push and pull and her friendships and everything else that leaves her exhausted and kind of exhausting to watch. So let's yeah. what first time seeing Jane and has your opinion evolved on on Jane and Holly Hunter's performance, Kathy? 
Well, I, I appreciate Jane after, yes, because the first time I watched it, I mean, well, you, I could appreciate her even when, when I saw it for the first time, but yes, she's one of those, you know, type A control freak, you know, purists, very rigid. I mean, and, and that, but, but I, what I love about her character development is how, I mean, forget about that scene with her father, you yeah. know, and her, her giving him a, a instruction on the, the meaning of the word obsession. But anyway, just her speech at the uh, journalism conference no balance it's she's very very rigid it's she's a purist and mm -hmm. it was annoying she's one of those and but i liked seeing her she her attraction to tom took her out of her comfort zone and it was brilliant because there she was very condescending to him and made no secret and almost seemed a little bit happy to tell anybody who'll listen how she didn't respect him because of, you know, because of his background. But, you know, she she came to, you know, I think her attraction influenced her to to appreciate him for what he was and what he was contributing. And I think that, that scene at the end where she, and by the way, I don't think, I don't think that was an, an intentionally bad act on his part. I think he was genuinely concerned about, or not, sorry, not concerned, but confused about what you are allowed to do when they're, when they're uh, taping cutaways, right? Cause they do tape cutaways. Mm -hmm. This we know. And so I think he was genuinely like, well, they tape cutaways. So why can't I, why can't I have tears in them? Why is that bad? But I think that the, it was, it was interesting when she finally saw that after Aaron told her to go check the tapes out how it it sort of jolted her out of her her you know little crush she had but yeah but i appreciated and now that i'm older and i can watch her i appreciate her even more and i appreciate the fact that aaron was a little bit of like a sleaze to her i don't i don't agree with you know i mean look people experience unrequited attraction or unrequited affection and it the responsibility lies with them man or woman to you know you're in the friend zone and you can't force somebody to like you and you need to lay off and i think that she did not lead him on now that i'm older and i watch that movie with you know uh many decades of being a, a woman out in the world i i think she was kind kinder to aaron than i would have been because he was kind of a jerk yeah. the way he pursued her and was you know, it's like, she doesn't want you, dude. Move on. It's it's fine. Not everybody's, you know, <laughs> not everybody is for everybody else. It's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, I really, I really loved her, her whole character evolution. Yeah, she's in an interesting world. They even have a scene with her that she's just sandwiched in between two businessmen sitting on the couch. And they never really make a big deal out of it. But it's, it's obvious that it's there that she is the sole female authority in this just male dominated world so she's she's trying to earn her respect and be the she gets promoted to be the first uh, female director and and other things throughout the movie but there are all these all these male interactions that she has to deal with as well and thankfully there's no never the one character that just talks down to her in a sexist manner, but I, I'm sure there, there was some. Cause she would destroy him. Well, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. The, the thing I love about her character, and this is something that Emily Mortimer did so well in the newsroom mm -hmm. is this is, this is the piece of broadcast news that I love the most is like, if you get a producer who is not in front of the camera willing to stick to actual like journalism chops like that is you're striking gold. Like that's, that's what I loved about this movie was you literally have a person willing to, you know, battle Satan over telling the correct story. And yeah, that's, that's what I agreed with the most. What, you know, where the, the, it's weird for me to try to go into a relationship standpoint for this movie because I actually don't like either of the main male characters that much. Like, obviously, Aaron's piece has merit, but he's also horrible. <laughs> and Tom's piece is as vapid as Tom's piece is, like, regardless of what his off screen 
personality is. And that is the thing about broadcast. You have an on-screen personality. You have an off-screen personality. You have the nice guy that you can date and be your husband and have kids with, but then he's going to go on screen and have something else. So there's a lot going on here, and it's one of those things for her. I'm glad she chose neither. This is one of the few movies you'll ever get where nobody gets the girl, and I'm like, I don't know who you actually married in the long run if you did, but good for him because – Neither of these guys were worth her. They actually shot an alternative, though, where Tom gets in the cab with her. And there it was supposed to be a surprise. She wouldn't know. And somebody right before they were getting ready to roll said, hey, Bill. And she knew that uh, William Hurt was on the set, so it ruined it. She said she had an out-of-body experience. And everybody thought, eh. This doesn't work. It it wasn't just right. So it's interesting that they considered having that change of heart. I also like that neither of them got the girl because I feel like it made it more about the point about the news than yeah. about the rom-com. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. About her. And also, and I mean, James Brooks, I think he, in an interview or a couple of interviews, said that he had, he, he'd gone with her getting with both of them like i mean that he had flushed out that uh those scenarios and decided to 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 keep it like you said about her being in her job but i do think though that it was a valuable experience for her to be attracted to tom he wasn't obviously the right person for her by any stretch of the imagination but it was a valuable experience for her wouldn't you say yeah it she almost had to go through like a schoolgirl phase the way she talks to him on the phone even how she says hi again with this big smile on her face very puppy love like but she gets petty with jennifer she sends her to alaska so right. i i i agree i think there was a lot a lot of <laughs> personal growth and i think they all wound up with their own passions so her passion was for the news and she winds up Tom recognizes it and says, you would be the best editor that I could get. And I think that would be super awkward to work together again. But, you know, hopefully it it works out in this story. Aaron finds his happiness in Portland. And Tom finds a fiancé. We don't really get to spend much time with his fiancé. But, you know, he's getting the anchor job. And so everyone's really, they're satisfied with their passions and they don't need each other. As far as this love triangle, what struck me with this and Brian brought up the newsroom as well. A big part of the newsroom is how the news is presented. And a big part of the scandal is we got it wrong. That's not happening here. But what we're seeing here are Aaron refers to it as just like a slow degradation. It's small steps. And we start with just fill they they tell tom to fill for they're waiting on i i don't remember what i think it was the navy captain or someone in the military yeah yeah, to speak and tom interjects with i think we'll all be okay and we get the lovely pushback from ernie who's old school and he just says who ask you (laughs) exactly yeah and they're purists they're purists in that way, aren't they? Yeah. Nobody nobody wants a, a, a real journalist doesn't give opinion, right? And they're purists in that way. And and I feel like in terms of you can have that in a variety of jobs, but is there one that needs that more than journalism? Mm, yeah. I mean Like I, I I will call out like stuck up things in film all day long. But when it, you know, comes back to the mean where I'm really like, okay, no, this is where you don't editorialize your own piece in this. Like, this is where the buck stops. Like, this needs to be the place where it is pure work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think he didn't, you know, and he's ever the salesman, right? 
you know, when he, when he didn't have copy in front of him or on the teleprompter or whatever, you know, he, that was what he, not being a trained journalist, that's what he went for, right? Because the salesman in him is like, okay, what is, with this 10 seconds that I have, what, what, what do the people listening want me to say, right? And I, I find that so interesting because while he did recognize when he was promoted to, to anchor um, in New York, he recognized that there's no way he was qualified for managing editor. And that's why he, he said, we're going to split this up because traditionally, right, that was the point they made. The anchor was the managing editor, right? Right. And so people were surprised when he turned down that aspect of the role and it, it split into, you know, two, two different roles and Jane took the, the managing editor. Um, so, but to his credit, he, he recognized his limitations and said, I, I, I want the product to be, to be good. Genuine. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I actually don't think there's an antagonist in this movie. Right. Like there, there's, there's not a bad person. Mm, Paul. <laughs> this movie kind of vaguely took you in a direction where you weren't sure exactly where it was going. And each character, it's almost like an RPG in a way. Like each character ha- like just picked one thing to just be really, really good at. <laughs> Aaron's maxed out on intelligence, but no charisma. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and, and all of these people culminated in one place that if they actually took a minute to get outside themselves, to get outside their world, they could see that. Can you actually imagine if Tom was the face, Aaron brought in the intelligence, like in terms of reporting, and then she she put it all together to feed him like the, the the triangle here is not a, a relationship triangle. It's the perfect setup for how we can report the news. Well, I agree with you totally. And I, you know, and I think people don't, you know, you don't have to be a purist in that respect because again, he, he serves a purpose, right? People need, you know, just it, talking about the, the, you know, the Nixon Kennedy debate for whatever reason, people need their, their influencers, right. Yeah. <laughs> to be a certain way and whatever you know and that's fine you know if they need a face that looks like you know that that's william hurt okay great you know but you know that to your point yes it's a product i mean i'm in i'm in software development and i'm an analyst and and i i understand all of the different roles that come together to make a product right and i'm sure other people who are in in product development understand that it's not one person you know, just kind of doing doing the whole job for everybody. It, 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 it's, it's a perfect, it's a synergy. And I think it's appropriate. Because, and I don't think that it's fooling anybody. I don't think that they're, you know, some people might argue, the purists might argue, well, you know, it's a, it's a facade. But it isn't, though. Why is it a facade, you know? I mean, if, if, if they're delivering... Why does the delivery matter? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. As long as... Now, I'll tell you why. Because... They want to say in the face that the delivery has, and and I feel like that's where this this went a little wonky. It's like, okay, why does the delivery matter? Well, because we did it, so it it needs to be our piece. It needs to be our face that delivers it. And I'm like, well, maybe you're not up to the task, and, and that's what this this goes to. So. If everyone understood the, the reason this is such a, a great triangle isn't the relationship piece. It's the no one really, except maybe Holly Hunter, got their place. Like you have Tom who wants to be better. You have Aaron who knows he's better, but Tom's speaking piece is better. Like if if the synergy was correct with all three it would have been devastating to the rest of the world of journalism because what can be brought in, what can be tapered and then broadcast would have been perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, those scenes where they're all collaborating, collaborating are just electric. It's, yeah. it's fun seeing them all play off each other, but it's interesting here. The criticisms, they, they seem small compared to, 
the things that we've seen, I couldn't help but think of Brian Williams. You know, my my head goes, and there are plenty of other people. I, I feel like I'm sing, singling out Brian Williams, but his helicopter scandal of, oh yeah, we were getting shot at, because it made the piece more interesting. And he was suspended for that, and it came out. But the things were editorializing now and the station if if you recall why it was getting a massive layoff was they didn't have wednesday programming now this right. is 1987 so it may be hard for people to remember a time that where we don't have a 24-hour news cycle news for us yeah yeah so there there's paul he I would say he is the antagonist. He's the studio executive. That's where you do uh, Survivor Antigua. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's right. he's just this uh, network executive, and he's kind of reading the tea leaves, and he's the first to recognize, hey, Tom, Tom's it, and hey, we need more programming, and we need more of this. And the purists are pushing back. And man, I wish we lived in a society where the purist won, because uh, here in 2022, uh, we're uh, oh, it's we're just giving yeah. our opinions willy nilly. In fact, it is. It's later. all yeah, it's all commentary. I mean, you really have to search for just news. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's truly terrible. And and, and again, you know, where my my first like intrigue into this went was the newsroom, which. I understand being from Sorkin was, you know, liberally biased, but the questions he brings up about the profession are correct. Mm -hmm. Like, and the things that like Emily Mortimer brings up as a producer are correct. Like it's trying to suck it back in. Like, come on guys, we've got a gut now. We got to work on our apps. Let's do it. Let's let's bring it back. And that commentary that became such based on a Bush presidency, but that commentary should have found some standing. Like, you know what I mean? Like some footing to say, let's take journalism back. And I'm telling you, like outside of a couple little spots, this is a rough neighborhood these days. Yeah, well, because you have two, you have two things that are a problem, right? Back in the day, when he made that comment about, you know, all these layoffs are because they, you know, the entertainment division didn't know how to program Wednesday nights or whatever, right? So it was, it was like the, the newspaper that comment about how the newspaper style section and all of the advertising that goes into the newspaper style section literally pays everybody's salary and and in the network news world right back in the day because network what is network news anyway anymore um but back in the day you know all the networks tried to program their entertainment so that they could get all the advertisers and all the money so that they didn't have to worry about sales right when it came to delivering the news Right. They could just deliver. I mean, obviously, they still needed the the handsome face and the and the face that people trust and blah blah blah. You know that that part is the sale. The selling of the news has always been, I think, as long as there has been visual media, right? You need a face. I mean, it's like if I'm standing, you know, if you if you and I are standing face to face, and I've got a piece of spinach stuck in my tooth. I, I could be saying the most brilliant thing you've ever heard in your life and you're not going to hear half of it because it's like, dude, you have spinach in your teeth, right? So it's always been the need for the person, the face that people feel comfortable with delivering the news has always been there. But now, you know, we don't have the situation where the news division is being paid for by successful entertainment division uh, revenues. And so now the news divisions are even more, for, you know, forced to, to, to worry about revenue and clicks and mm -hmm. i often wonder if people even really consider ethical journalism anymore no right well we've we've, we've had uh, uh, uh proof of that today with buzzfeed about the death of queen elizabeth being completely fake so whoops right oh i didn't even hear that yeah oh yeah yeah buzzfeed posted that um uh queen elizabeth died and then he backtracked like when have i been wrong Long live the queen. <laughs> Long live the queen. Yeah. So it's yep. the world we live in now. She's a big fan of the podcast. So, you know, <laughs> get well soon. 
We'll have to tweet her later. Yes. yes. Let her know she's she's featured. Yes. Get, <laughs> Long live the queen. Get well soon, your ma- your majesty. But uh, yeah, we talk about faces you trust, and I do want to mention uh, there were some alternative castings here. Uh, Jane's part was written for Deborah Winger, but uh, she was pregnant with her son Noah Hutton, and so Holly Hunter was cast. Sigourney Weaver. Elizabeth Perkins, Catherine O'Hara, they all were considered or auditioned. But Faces We Trust, we've got Jack Nicholson as the anchor here. He's like the big time paid anchor. And I've seen a lot of Jack Nicholson movies. and Maybe that's just biased me and conditioned me, me to say, I don't trust you for one single <laughs> minute. He's got that good look, though. I, yeah. I'm telling you, if you're going to satire how broadcast journalists look on screen and then try to put a, a sinister slant on it how are you not going to use jack nicholson there yeah, like I agree, just yeah. oh yeah, yeah this is exactly what <laughs> i think that was I, I i would venture to say that that was james i think james considered that yeah 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 um, yeah yeah and, and james brooks we've talked a lot about him he's our director his big movie, Terms of Endearment, talked about that a little bit, followed by Broadcast News. He's got As Good As It Gets, Spanglish, How Do You Know? And he's a writer and producer, actually a writer for the Simpsons movie. Uh, I have not seen his later things with Playdate with Destiny. But yeah, what? Are, Kathy, you mentioned Terms of Endearment was big for you, but are his works you mentioned Mary Tyler Moore and, and Rhoda was he involved I'm not seeing Oh my that. god that's those were his shows yeah okay. so he so he was like for 70s TV he was like I, I mean maybe you could like Shonda right because with all of the streaming services and all of the the new programming that's coming up everywhere the fact that you think of TV and you can name one one producer behind all these hit shows like Grey's Anatomy and stuff mm-hmm. Is, is pretty impressive, I have to say, but I'm not a fan of her work. I think Grey's Anatomy, you know, I'm an ER, I'm a purist when it comes okay. to medical drama. Nobody will ever do ER, nobody can top ER. But anyway, um, but so if in the 70s, right, I mean, Mary Tyler Moore was like, that was serious, seriously popular TV. And, you know, uh, Rhoda, Lou Grant, and even in the 90s, he did tra- the Tracy Ullman show. So yeah, he he's a big time tv writer and producer i like how he hit on this like that's it's it's important for how i've seen things go to the future that this happened when it did yeah yeah and it's interesting i just didn't know that tv background but he's got a lot of strong female characters that he's written for prior to this mary tyler moore being just an icon so that's that's great. Well, check out. So I think so if I know you guys, if I can predict, I think you guys might actually appreciate Taxi. Yes. If you can, I don't know. I'm sure Taxi has got to be in reruns somewhere. Oh, yeah. And we get a Taxi cameo, by the way. J. Allen Thomas, who was Jeff on Taxi. He's one yeah. of our cabbies. So that was a fun cameo. But but yeah, he was he's he was great. I loved him anyway. Um, I, I remember him from Morgan Mindy. Yeah, so we, we've talked a lot about the the time and all of this, in how the 80s was just, it's the beginning of bad, <laughs> which Russell would would say it's the beginning of a lot of bad things, fashion trends, all, all of that. We, we've got some definitive 80s hair. Joan Cusack back again with the 80s hair. Uh, what do you guys think of our costuming, our wardrobes, our... Our 1987 wardrobe. Well, Russell would appreciate the uh, shoulder pad joke. Yes. I think he would, he'd get a hook. uh, Yeah, yeah. That was great, by the way. Holly Hunter taking out her shoulder pads and stuffing them to help Aaron out. That was great. And then Aaron told her later one of them drowned. Yeah. (laughs) It went missing. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, you know, that's just, that's my, those are my teenage years. So I kind of am like, yeah, that's how we used to dress. (laughs) Yes. Still uh, commiserating with Joan Cusack. Yes. She is one of the great character actors, I think, of all time. Don't you agree? I don't know if you guys saw her in Shameless. Anyway, I don't want to get off topic, but she's awesome. I love her. She was awesome. I didn't really... If you guys have anything to add, I didn't really 
see much in the soundtrack other than there there was the fun little bit of their actual Grammy winning musicians that are playing those dorky little jingle writers. So that that was fun. But other than that, the soundtrack, it, it didn't do much for me. Uh, I, I've got one small, small thing sure. right here. I actually have uh, one <laughs> that French song mm-hmm. that Aaron's listening to in his house. I actually have that whole album. Of course it's, you do. It's, it's considered French pop, but I mean, I the uh, Spanish guitar that they rock through that. I, I really enjoyed it. I when I heard it, I was like, oh my god, I've got this album. <laughs> it's like in a movie that was thoroughly deve- uh, devoid of most soundtrack worthy pieces. It's like, oh, I actually have this. So anyway, the guy's name's Francis Cabal or Cabrel, and I'm really. I love that song and his work. Yeah, I love how they also closed. They closed it out in the credit. It was in the credits too. Yeah, I did not watch the full credits. Shame on pardon, you. Pardon, pardon. Shame on you. <laughs> Shame on you. You can redeem yourselves because we are going to get into our movie superlatives. It's my favorite part of the show. So, Kathy, our MVP for broadcast news, nineteen eighty-seven. Director, actor, supporting actor, who do you have? Ah, uh, gosh, I mean, it, it's it got to be Jane or Aaron. I mean, I, I got to go with Aaron just because Albert Brooks, and I, like, I liked his evolution. I liked how, what, a, what a petty little shite he was. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, I mean, so obviously I don't like those qualities in an actual person that I know, but I, I thought it was, uh, I thought his character had a lot of depth and uh I appreciated it. Excellent. Brian? I think I want to go with Holly Hunter on this. I was just like, this is this is who you want running your new show. Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's the bottom line of this. Uh, the same thing that I brought up earlier about Emily Mortimer. Like, this is, it's not just about young, pale brunettes that I find incredibly attractive. It is about the news. And who is running your new show? And she could have butchered that Georgian accent, so props to her for getting that at least believable. She was closer than Cleary's. Yeah. Yeah, I I wish I had picked William Hurt. I, I would like to, just so we could have that triangle to, here, but I went with James Brooks. I just felt there were too many good pieces, and when there are a lot of good pieces, I tend to credit the director here. I think the story's really compelling, and it just kept me invested throughout. Yeah, I think, in fact, that, th- that he wrote the screenplay. Actually, you know, I, I, I almost want to change my answer just because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this was, his, this was his story for real, and he gave it a great life. Yes. Best supporting actor or actress, Kathy? Uh, I got to go with Joan. Mm-hmm. I mean, and the way it's just her whole, like, her whole sort of, like, like bohemian, bohemian style and but this like intense like that whole scene where she's carrying the tape to the uh uh where she's the bro- the the broadcast room hurdling like, like, kids yes yes yeah i mean she's awesome and then she was doing it in her little with her crazy hair and her big flowy dress you know she's she's her physical comedy is fantastic she's awesome i i think she, I, I i've seen I don't think I've missed too much of what she's done in her whole career. I would support casting her whenever there is a cubicle. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> in office setting, she is just magic. Brian, who, who do you have? I actually want William Hurt on this. Okay. Um, the thing that we get into sometimes is about characters you like versus don't like. William Hurt did a phenomenal job being exactly the character they needed him to be he entered being the deficient person who was not credibly you know able to do the position he said as much then he schmoozed his way in and amongst even his best critics until he was called out by like the end all of like no you still don't credibly get what you get 
So I, I just feel like he did exactly what he needed to do while being himself. And look, I'll say this straight out. If you're in front of a camera, there's a chameleon piece of this where I don't think you actually really know where you are or who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think William Hurt is my supporting, hands down. Yeah, and he's a great actor, too. He got he got doubly blessed. I mean... You know, he's not just a leading man. He he's he's like a really good actor and I too went with Joan Cusack for all the reasons that Kathy covered. I just think she's fantastic and I want more Joan Cusack in my movies. <laughs> for our hidden gem, our underappreciated minor caster element, Kathy, we'll go with you. I'm gonna go really, really deep. Okay. I forget his character. I should remember. I mean, I, I can picture him. But remember when they were doing layoffs and William Hurt's character was waiting outside mm-hmm. um, to get his news. He didn't realize he was getting good news. And the one of the staff, one of the newsroom, I think he was one of the reporters, um, field reporters. You know, he walked out of the office and uh, the president of the news division, you know, shook his hand and said, if there's anything you can, I'm so sorry. And if there's anything you can do, I can do. Yeah, he said, I certainly hope you'll die soon. <laughs> yes, that was Robert Prosky. He plays Ernie Merriman. That that was my pick, too. <laughs> oh, it was. It was, I certainly hope you'll die soon. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah, because he goes on and talks about early retirement and everything else. Yeah. yeah. All right. Brian, who's your hidden gem? My hidden gem for this movie was uh, John Cusack. John Cusack yes. was, in fact, in this movie. As the, uh, I guess he was a messenger boy, but I, I rewinded the movie, like, rewound the movie, like, three times trying to figure out who he was until I realized you don't actually get to see his face. He's a dude who just rolls out after the layoffs and he says, sons of bitches, and he throws yes. his, his messenger sack down. And I was like, you know what? I respect the fact that John and Joan Cusack don't do things apart. Like despite times. who's who's whose level is higher in terms of like who's actually in the movie, I love the fact that they keep that stuff tight. That's that's awesome. I, I love that. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying I saw that it was a collaboration and I saw hey, they've been together in ten different movies, but I could not so you've solved a mystery for me. I couldn't figure oh, out where he I, was. I love Cusack, all of it, yes. the, the the Cusack collective. Yeah, and as I said, I, I picked Robert Prosky, who plays Ernie Merriman. This one can be our tough question, our recast. You have to recast someone in this movie. Kathy, who are you recasting? This is going to be mean, though. I don't know, because I don't know, so I'm going to pick on... Do we? That whole, okay, that whole scene. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to do this. That whole scene... Where remember how I was talking about when Ernie's daughter came in, mm-hmm. and he was like, "Oh, Tom, my daughter just loves you. She wants to meet you." And and Aaron is just like, "What about me? I met you. Don't you want to see me?" Yes. And I was just like, "Why are you just just ugh, doing this to yourself?" I I want to make somebody more. I want to put somebody in her place who's more interesting to be worthy <laughs> of Aaron disgracing himself like that i don't know i I couldn't think of anybody else and so i kind of circled back to that because i was just like wait what okay so going after amy brooks who plays ellie merriman yes okay yeah you want a slightly older maybe more more attractive person like his daughter's in early 20s something like that yeah i mean yeah i guess i i guess i implied that she should have been more attractive she just should have been more interesting to to warrant him fawning over her like that i mean but i mean i think obviously the point of the scene was i i want to be tom desperately i want people to respect me yeah like they respect tom and i want to have influence over people like he does gotcha gotcha brian who are you recasting you know it was weird for me on this because i actually changed this three different times and i did it for all three major actresses or mm-hmm. actors and actresses I fell on Albert Brooks because I felt like his piece was where the the comedic piece of this fell, more so. And uh, I went with Steve Martin. Okay. Like if Steve Martin had played Albert Brooks, maybe 
that humor piece would come across less creepy. He was. He was super creepy to me. Uh, I, a lot of his statements, even in angst against Tom's piece, like it just it, it, it fell hard. Like it fell rough and and bitter. And I think that that could have done with more humor. Gotcha. Gotcha. And he he can be a jerk. He starred in a movie called The True. Jerk. So, yeah. so yes, with with me and I feel bad because you guys have kind of convinced me that he was right for the role. But Jack Nicholson, who offered not to be paid for this role, he insisted on it. I just kind of, which is hilarious, given the courts in the movie. Right. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't take a pay cut at all. I'm sure they, they put that <laughs> in there, lower it a million or so. And we can. Uh, yeah. But I. I've never had a Jack Nicholson movie where he's not nominated for best of something. So in here, I'm just like, yeah, you're wasting Jack Nicholson. He didn't have a Jack Nicholson moment. So I, I kind of want the Wall Street star here. I want Michael Douglas. I think he mm. could have come in and commanded that good look. But at the same time, yeah, I'm not I'm not compromising my salary or anything. Yeah, I, I could I mean, I, I loved Nicholson in it, but yeah, I could get I could get down with Michael Douglas. Yep. He was busy with Wall Street that year, I guess. Yes, yes he was very busy. <laughs> that was a but big year for him. He can double dip. It's a small role. Yeah, yeah. So, so best shot, Kathy. I mean, okay, uh, most impactful, perhaps. Going to be a couple that land on Jane's face because Holly Hunter, props to her, great acting in this. Just the the sheer, just like jolt that she experienced when she realized that he, that Tom had, you know, worked up tears for that, the, the, the cutaways. Yeah. That yeah. was, I mean, it's, it's a small scene, but it's just, it really, it really brings her full circle. You're right. That facial acting said so much that that, that was fantastic work on her part. Brian, what's your best shot? No, my best shot is the look down on the newsroom. One of my favorite things in the world is the actual idea that the news is produced and shown for the people. And that shot from the, the basic uh, producer's room down, that's awesome. Like, yeah. I, I, I got to walk through one of those one time, and I understand that that's a weird thing to just fixate on. But... There was a time where we did this the right way. And to see where people did it the right way was really impactful to me. Yeah. And yeah, so that was my favorite shot. It's a yeah, like having stage. the control room up up, at, up higher than the stage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Awesome choice. With me, it's it's a little bit more simple of a scene, but... During Tom's interview with the rape victim, even though it winds up being fake, I think the shot with him crying, you know, that that was what wound up being called moving. It was what got all the office workers other than Aaron. Aaron's just like, yeah, whatever. But that was a shot where I wrote down immediately. Oh, oh, that's good. That's that's a good cut. But, you know. I was deceived too, so I'm going to throw it in there because it deceived me. Right. It had layers. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> if you fool me, you win. So, best scene, Kathy? When Jane and Aaron found out what the assignments were and Ernie said, don't look at me, you know, uh, the the, pres the president of the news division was in town. He, he made the assignments. He was at Ernie's house for the party. He said, I, I had nothing to do with this. He overruled me. And she took him outside and she said, we need Aaron for the job that we're capable of. And he said, great. I, I appreciate your opinion. I just don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. And she said, but you're, you're wrong. It's not opinion. It's fact. And he said to her, it must be so difficult for you to really believe that you're always right. And that people who agree with you are just automatically wrong, that your assessment of everything is is the only correct one he said it must you know it must be great and she said no it's just, it makes me miserable yeah. um that that exchange was did so much for us to understand her character yeah that's powerful 
A hundred percent. And I, I will also say that outside of the guy from Law and Order in the newsroom, she would be correct. <laughs> right. <laughs> Brian, what was your best scene? I really enjoyed the uh, Joan Cusack getting the tape to the broadcast room. Mm-hmm. Like the, the like I've had so many of those days where I'm like, can anything else get between me and my goal? Like seriously, like come on world. Can you give me one more thing? I just need <laughs> one more thing in between me and that and, it, and it'll fail. So I I'd say that. That was actually mine as well. So I, I do have a backup. The, the first scene where Tom gets his uh, anchor position where he gets to have Jane in his ear talking to him and he just comes out and he's like, that was electric. It was like really great sex. And the, she's on the chair and he's basically on top Banger, of her. Like with the chair? Like yeah. It, he's like, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's a little awkward. Yeah, I've had to take several mandatory trainings in my field that says do not do that but you know, <laughs> the, the the scene is just electric and they're both just exploring this new attraction in this chemistry and it i really enjoyed that scene just to see them act like teenagers they were so happy about it best wardrobe and makeup moments again i wish russell were joining us because he would just say none of it brian i actually love holly hunter's wardrobe and all this because she's the one person actually i'd say she's one of two people in this thing that just had her stuff unlocked the entire time and the wonderful thing about people away from the camera is no one cares and she rocks that no one cares <laughs> so well. And not only does she walk, rock the no one cares so well, but when she actually has to bring it, it's hot. Yeah. Like, it's like, wow, look at you. And it, it, I, I want to call it the Liz Lemon, like when she's <laughs> behind the camera and no one, it, like she rocks that Liz Lemon for a long time. And then all of a sudden yeah. you're like, smoke show yeah she goes from yeah. sweats to what i i my choice was that dress i think it's just memorable with the big bow on the front and the v split yeah you're right when she has those moments to really show off i think those those are her entire wardrobe is great because you you just get to see that i don't know that i'd call it growth but just different personalities for her yeah, and it was so, and you are so right, both of you, because it, it speaks to, like, her evolution. She was able to kind of step outside of her rigid world and have just a proper crush. Yeah. And that dress was feminine. It was pretty. Her hair was done. She was, she wanted to be, you know, a pretty, beautiful woman. And when, obviously, when she's working, it's, hair and makeup is secondary, right? Yeah. And it's interesting that they Brooks used the opportunity at back to Ernie's party. Remember when Tom said, "Oh, you look so nice." Not like you look at or he said, "You look so clean and pretty today." Mm-hmm. And she said, "What do you mean clean?" Yeah. And he said, "Well, when you're at the office, you have a film over you." Just oh my god, it's just a, such a great screenplay by the way. <laughs> yeah. As she immediately leaves. It's like, "Whoops." Right. Yeah, that yeah. was a bad thing to say. Yeah. So so this is always tough. We'll we'll go with Kathy for our what are you changing? Our change one thing moment. But I was thinking about when they were at the the, the, the scene after the layoffs and you know, the Aaron and Jane's relationship had really taken a taken a hit uh, when she was kind of rejected him that last time. And he he had I think he did right by her telling her mm-hmm. um, about, you know, to, to look at the tape. But that, I didn't I didn't think that cheap that cheap shot about, oh, you know, where will we be in seven years? Oh, well, you know, my my son and I will be walking down the street with my beautiful wife and and we'll we'll see you. And I'll tell my son to it's not nice to make fat of, you know, make fun of fat single ladies or something. I mean, I, I think it was. I, I think it was used to really illustrate in a quick, in a, very quickly, how hurt he was. But I hated that he was still so petty about yeah. her, 
her, her breaking his heart when he had no reason to be. She never, she never led him on, I don't think. So, Brian, change one thing. I wanted more news on this. My change one thing was, like, I, I actually wanted more I- interaction with what, what was going on and less about what was going on in their personal lives. Those are the most exciting scenes, so yeah, I definitely get that. For me, it I understand why they had so many shots of Jane crying, but... It was to emphasize, you know, her this destructive devotion to work and absolutely nothing else in her life. But they seem jarring. I really felt like there could be better transitions. the The one that bothered me the most was her just bawling on the docks. It just didn't make sense. So I, I'm gonna cut that because they, they made her obnoxious a couple too many times, and I felt like that one was the one that I just. It seemed less provoked, so less crying. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, she made. I think she made time in, in every day. She she made some crying time, um, <laughs> uh, in every day for her. That makes for sense. Her release. Yeah. yeah. No one else walking into that newsroom while she's bawling her eyes out even checks. So they're just like, "Yep, it's Tuesday." So. Yeah. I was also a little upset that she had like some just regular newsroom desk while basically everybody she worked with had a real office right. like she was like gangland doing this and i'm like really yeah yep no uh no closed door for you are <laughs> there were a lot of great quotes and actually some of the quotes made it into best of all time but kathy what is your best quote the devil quote he's the devil and and she said no what are you talking about how do you what do you think the devil's gonna look like you think he's going to be scary? I, I, I even, I have been using some variation of this quote since I, since I saw the movie. In fact, I even gave my son when my son was very small. I said, "Don't just because somebody looks trustworthy." I, you know, this is I'm paraphrasing, but I, I tried to explain what we, we used to call human monsters was our sort of version of the the boogeyman speech. Just because someone looks nice doesn't mean they are. Mm-hmm. Because they want they want you to think they're nice, so that's why they they're invested in looking nice. And that's that's when the devil comes to take us all, right? He's gonna be he's gonna be in the form of some, you know, social media influencer. Or yeah, something. the devil appears as an angel of light. <laughs> right. I mean, if you yeah, we're going old school quotes now, but yeah, that I loved that that whole quote, and I wish I could have done it better justice. I, I should have written it down. But. Brian, what's yours? I'll give you that one. Uh, I know you care about them. I've never seen you like this about anyone. So please don't take it wrong when I tell you that I believe that Tom, while a very nice guy, is the devil. (laughs) So anyway, that's for you. Now, my best quote is, uh, well, I certainly hope you'll die soon. (laughs) Yes. Hi, dude, that's the best. It's like, oh, thank you for firing me. I really hope you off really hardcore later yes, yes thank you for i know that, that gets no uh, sorry i know i knew that was gonna get censored but I, I mean that's that's just the best it's like oh i know i've done my job very very well for you and now you're axing me because you know pretty people take precedence thank you yes. have a nice yep and old guy and old ways yeah absolutely <laughs> i Mine, I've got a backup quote because I had the devil quote as well. The flash over stuff, substance, just a tiny bit. I, I did think all that was great. But Aaron's quote, when he's just floundering at the end, he's like, at least 22 people dead. I wish I were one of them. <laughs> like, I, I feel that in my soul. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, now it's time. And this... For two of us, this is a brand new movie. But, Kathy, we're going to do our ratings and recommendations. Zero to five stars, half star increments, unless you're Brian. What are you giving broadcast news? Oh, it's a five star movie, in my opinion. And by the way, uh, trivia, it made, I think, every single top ten list like that existed in 1987. It was on it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it nailed it. Right, five stars. Brian, how are you following this up on your first time viewing? 
I really enjoyed this. This is a four star rating for me. I'm right there with you. I really, really enjoyed it. The only thing that kept this from being a five star movie is I kind of didn't like the seven year jump at the end. And it, it just felt a. I don't know what would solve it for me, but I just was a little unsatisfied. So I went with a four and a half. But I. I really enjoyed this movie and I went in almost a little bit fearful. So great, great marks. I think it, it's got room to grow. So thank you so much, Kathy, for introducing this to us. And thank you for inviting me. I just love talking about movies and especially with you guys. Yeah. Awesome. Appreciate it. Well, speaking of movies, we're going to talk about Brian. Do you want to help me pick a movie for next time? Always and forever. So our Oscar season continues. With option one, we're going with Network 1976. A television network cynically exploits a deranged former anchor's ravings and revelations about the news media for its own profit, but finds that his message may be difficult to control. Option two, Fatal Attraction from 1987. A married man's one-night stand comes back to haunt him when that lover begins to stalk him and his family. Or option three, Gosford Park from 2001. Set in the 1930s, this movie brings a group of pretentious rich and famous together for a weekend of relaxation at a hunting resort. But when a murder occurs, each one of these interesting characters becomes a suspect. I mean, I've got to go Fatal Attraction. I mean, that's... Gotta talk about that. Not categorized as a horror movie, but I am campaigning for it to be a horror movie. Exactly. That's uh, basically what we've been talking about for this one. We're going to mirror it over to this. All right. Once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for rejoining us in February for our Joan Cusack movies. Kathy, really appreciated it. Thank you, all the lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. So subscribe, rate, review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps our visibility, helps other movie fans find us. Give us a like on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. And producing and providing this podcast is fun, but it's not free. So we invite you to support the show at our Patreon page, patreon.com slash retromovieroundtable. Any contribution is much appreciated and goes towards making the show better for you, the listeners. As always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Brian? I'm a registered Republican. I only seem liberal because I believe that hurricanes are caused by high barometric pressure and not gay marriage.